Hi, I'm Joan Bullock with Communications and Public Affairs, and welcome to Netline. We're here at Harperview Hospital where a conservation fair is going on. City Light will be at community fairs like this throughout the summer, and we hope you and your family can come visit with us. At the end of the program, we'll have a list of festivals and fairs where you can stop by. In this edition of Netline, we're going to take a look at Boundary Hydroelectric Project. This is City Light's biggest single source of power for our customers but many of us don't know that much about it. We're also going to look at how City Light is studying electric cars and how they may help cut down on air pollution in our region. But first we're going to hear about how long negotiations with a big wireless phone company led to free improvements to City Light's communication system and how it improved cell phone coverage. Cell phones have become almost as important to some people's daily life as, say, electricity. So this tower on City Light's Bothell substation seemed like a perfect match when local cell phone provider AT&T Wireless was looking for a way to expand its coverage in South Snohomish County. AT&T wanted to share the tower. There was a problem. Antennas from other cell phone companies and a wireless data company were already on the tower, and City Light was holding the remaining space for its own communications equipment. City Light needs the communications capabilities so the System Control Center in Seattle can communicate with the hydro operations up north, including the Skagit Hydroelectric Project and the transmission system. We came back with a suggestion. Our um, communications section came up back and said, well, we actually need a taller tower. If you would build a taller tower, we will allow you on this tower until it's built. Good idea, but would it work? Would a cell phone company agree for a rent credit? to design and build a tower tall enough to accommodate additional utility equipment, the existing wireless company's equipment, and its own? And AT&T Wireless said okay. So I negotiated a, a contract with them, um, and it took all, over four years to, to get this project completed. So we went through several designs and um, structural analyses. It took a while to get those where our engineers felt comfortable that they were really good and that, that we could live with them. And then the, the permitting process took probably two and a half years. But AT&T actually paid the entire cost of planning, designing, and building. Pretty good deal for City Light. I think it's a great deal. During construction, City Light electrician constructor Thomas Todd took a sequence of photos, capturing the construction process. Once operating to everyone's satisfaction, then down came the old tower. AT&T, now Singular Wireless, has improved its coverage in South Snohomish County, and City Light has the communications it needs. Plus, the old tower can be relocated to a new site. Peter Clark reporting for Seattle City Light. The energy situation facing the planet today, climate change, and the desire to decrease foreign oil dependence all make a better case than ever for using electric vehicles in the near future. It's not a new idea. These trolleys were powered by electricity in Seattle's early days. And today, City Light Electricity runs the trolleys through downtown. But these must be connected to strings of dedicated wires. The newest breed of electric vehicles operate on batteries. However, the batteries must be recharged from onboard gasoline-powered engines. A recent forum brought experts to Seattle to discuss a new breed of electric vehicles that will be plugged in to charge batteries, something that may be a wave of the future for utilities. Typically we envision plug-in hybrids with an electric range, an equivalent electric range of a, somewhere around 10 miles to 60 miles. We think the sweet spot for most people is around 20 miles. This means that for most of you as you're driving through downtown and urban areas, you're going to be mostly driving on electricity. If you, want to be, if you want to build public infrastructure in your communities, you, that takes it out to 40 miles if you have people charging while they're at work. So you have very good functionality and a dramatic reduction in the amount of petroleum you consume. Seattleites are familiar with the hybrid gas electric cars. Utilities and drivers could benefit from using electric plug-in vehicles, including everything from work vehicles to personal transportation. The operational cost could be a lot less than gasoline. The estimated equivalent is about 50 cents per gallon. 
Most vehicles would be plugged in at night when the demand for power is usually lowest. City Light is the first utility in the country to be greenhouse gas neutral, meaning we're able to offset any emissions our operations create. Use of electric vehicles may fit right into that effort. City Light's Lynn Best says the utility is considering how electric vehicles may fit into our future. There's a lot of potential out there. I think we need to realize, and the reason we're doing a study of this is that at this point, there are very few cars of this sort or any kind of vehicle being manufactured. We have to look into the economics, what the environmental opportunities might be, and also look you know, carefully about how that would fit into our system. But at this point, we're, we're optimistic and we really are looking forward to the potential that these vehicles could bring to our system. Hybrids are becoming more popular every day, especially with the price of gasoline so high. Lots of research and demonstration projects are underway to showcase plug-ins and to make a business case for their feasibility. The continuing national push for electric utilities to be involved in plug-in hybrids, City Light could possibly power your vehicle in the future. I'm Sharon Bennett for Seattle City Light. The Boundary Hydroelectric Project is a modern wonder of efficiency and a powerful dam. It provides more than half the city of Seattle's electrical needs and the power produced is some of the cheapest in the country. If you're wondering how the dam got its name, just a mile down river here, not even where it turns, is the border with Canada and it's quite well marked. The U.S. and Canada mark their border by making a clear cut all along this line, clear through to the Puget Sound. Meet Lonnie Johnson, Generation Supervisor at Boundary Dam. Johnson says Boundary can produce a lot of power, over one gigawatt, because it's blessed with a huge fuel source, the Pend Oreille, one of the largest rivers in the state. What that equates to is about 54% of the power that's necessary for the city of Seattle. If you journey to the top of the dam, you'll see it has a unique design. Gary Baird is the chief hydro operator at Boundary, and he'll tell you why. It's a double arch dam, which means that it's, it's curved both directions, horizontally and vertically. And uh, probably the most interesting thing about that is you can see from the top of the dam is that the top of the dam is 50 feet further downstream than the base of the dam. And uh, it's 32 feet thick at the base, it's 8 feet thick at the top. It's commonly referred to as an eggshell dam. Uh, it acts like an eggshell. It just it puts uh, the weight of the reservoir onto the rock abutments on either side. Boundary is also a famous dam. You may have seen it before. Look down and you'll see this spray deck stretching across the dam. This was converted into a frontier town for the Kevin Costner movie, The Postman. Yet while Hollywood filmed, the dam never stopped generating power. Boundary's 40 employees kept the power plant humming, even in the midst of the Tinseltown attention. Yet Boundary isn't alone on the Pend Oreille. It's one of four dams generating power from this mighty river. One is just upstream, Box Canyon Dam, owned by Pend Oreille County. Boundary Dam, though, is far larger and its structure more complex. Well, the dam is 340 feet from base to the top of the dam. Reservoir behind it is 17 and a half miles long. We have six generators located in this mountain behind me that can generate up to 1,050 megawatts. So the generators are actually embedded within the mountain behind you? That's correct. If you come down off the top of the dam and down to the visitor's parking lot, you'll see what Gary means. The only way into the power plant is through a tunnel blasted directly into the middle of this mountain. At the end of this road, you'll come to the visitor's gallery, carved right out of the rock like everything else. Go down these stairs and you'll see just how much rock was moved to create Boundary Dam's generating plant. The project was gargantuan. Seattle City Light undertook a huge engineering feat by blasting out the center of this mountain to create a space big enough to house these six enormous generators you can see here. The machine hall alone is 477 feet long. It's long enough to, for a uh, World War II size cruiser to fit inside, 17 stories high, it's all underground. 
down here on the floor of the power plant, it gets quite loud. That's the sound of raw power. All six generators are running now, cranking out more than a gigawatt of energy. That's 1,000 megawatts. One megawatt alone will power between 600 to 800 homes. Surprisingly, the plant cost $94 million and took only two years to build uh, back in the 1960s, the late 60s. Uh, really still quite an engineering feat when one considers the size of both the cavern that I explained earlier and also when you look at the dam itself. Seattle City Light employees work around the clock to keep this engineering marvel running. They recently completed a major rehab of the entire power plant and dam to make sure things run smoothly far into the future. This is how Boundary Dam generates power. The dam diverts the Ponderé River into six tunnels called penstocks. These plunge down from the dam to deep under the power plant floor into six large water wheels called turbines, forcing them to spin quickly. A shaft connects the turbines to magnets that also spin inside coils of copper wire. This creates electrical current. And that's what Boundary Dam sends from here in the power plant to transformers that send the electricity up and over this mountain using these unique towers called pickle forks and on to Bonneville Power Administration lines that deliver the power to Seattle. These six huge caps you see here on the machine hall floor house the turbines and the generators. If we head down these stairs, we'll show you an up-close look at how these operate. As Gary shows us, these are the main instruments the technicians use to operate the separate turbines. And here you can actually see the shaft spinning. There's so much friction generated here that each of the turbines has a cooling jacket of river water to keep their temperature low. As you can guess, this entire area is not only loud, it's warm. That heat comes from the friction. Working in a mountain also makes for an interesting work environment. The employees that labor here 24-7 to keep Boundary running never know what the weather's like outside, constantly work to maintain equipment built into solid rock, and have a battle every winter with dripping groundwater coming out of these rock walls. If we go deeper down into the power plant, we'll come to the actual turbine. There is no way to hear anything down here, but the roar coming from the pond array as it turns this huge turbine that then spins this shaft to create electricity. Now you can see why so much of this mountain had to be tunneled out. The turbine generator assemblies are 271 feet high, and the turbines themselves weigh a whopping 65 tons apiece. Now we descend even lower into the power plant, we are currently over 100 feet below the visitor's gallery where we entered and very deep within the power plant. This door is the gate to the penstock, the water tunnel that feeds the turbines. Behind this heavy door, water rushes by at 9,600 cubic feet per second. It is this kind of water pressure that spins the massive turbines. After descending through even more tunnels, we finally come to the very base of the project. 17 and a half stories straight down through solid rock. What you're looking at here is an air shaft. We're nearly at the very bottom of the powerhouse. This is an area visitors rarely get to see, and it's very cold down here. They use this cold air to help with air conditioning, and behind me is actually the Ponderay River. If it wasn't plugged, water would be rushing right through here. Behind this plug in the very basement of this massive project runs the Ponderay. We take a different route back to the surface. This massive service tunnel is dank and damp this far below the river. Water gently weeps through every fissure in the rock. But the higher we climb, the drier the tunnel becomes. Once outside, we meet up again with Lonnie Johnson, who explains that power can be produced at Boundary Dam very efficiently, under three cents a kilowatt hour. The three cents per kilowatt hour means for the city of Seattle that we have one of the lowest priced electric rates within urban North America. And all because the Pend Oreille is such a powerful river and great natural asset to the Pacific Northwest. I'm Kelly Gunther for Seattle City Light.
Thanks for watching. I'm Joan Bullock for Seattle City Light. Now here are a few of the summer community events I spoke of at the beginning of the program.